It's so great to see everyone. Well, not really see you, I'm sure. You know, you're seeing us, we're not seeing you, but I'm seeing the names, I'm seeing everybody log in. Debbie, so nice to see you say hello. Um, we're super excited to be here today as people are logging in. Um, I'm here with Antonio Perry, our friend from Larkin University. And uh, as everybody is signing in here, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping and some introductions before I let Antonio take it away because we only have an hour and he has so much value and insight to bring to this. I just kind of want to let him off the leash, if you will. Um, so all of you are muted, as you know. You can use the webinar um, Q&A to ask questions or send feedback. I'm definitely going to leave lots of time for Q&A at the end so we can um, kind of hold our questions for them. Uh, the webinar recording will be available. It usually goes out tomorrow morning. So um, if you have uh, colleagues who signed up and couldn't attend, they will get this recording as well. Um, and then in the chat, just a little bit of housekeeping. Tell me where you're from, the institution that you represent. And as we're doing that, I will give a little bit of background here. So I am your uh, main host here from NFLUX. My name is Megan Milcharik. I am the head of education and assessment at NFLUX. I'm sure you saw my bio when you registered, um, but I have been working in the assessment space for the past seven years, roughly. Um, and I have worked in schools um, for liberal arts education, healthcare education, most recently in schools of pharmacy. And I'm joined here today by Antonio Perry, um, the Assistant Dean of Assessment and Credit Accreditation for the College of Pharmacy at Larkin. Um, Antonio and I have spent the past year, it seems like, meeting very frequently and talking. And he's just one of those people, my assessment people know this, when you meet somebody else who just, you just kind of get it, it's like, it's like puzzle pieces fitting together. And I feel like that's been the nature of our relationship over the past year. Lots of really insightful conversations and he's brought a ton of value um, to myself in the past year. He also has spent time, um, and you'll see this in his procedure and the way that he approaches things. He served our country in the Air Force and afterwards received a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in rehab and mental health counseling. And he's currently pursuing his PhD. So nothing really stands in his way. Did I miss anything, Antonio? No, no they're not here to, to hear from me. They're ready to hear the, uh, <laughs> about the content. <laughs> there we go. All right. So at the content we're going to cover today, identifying and tracking at-risk students based on a whole host of uh, measurables, assessment grades, and category performance amongst them, tracking your high-impact courses for early indicators and student success, Drilling deeper into the data, not just staying at that top level, but really getting down into it to look for those stress points and the gaps in what we're covering. And then using the NFLUX platform to have that access to clean, actionable data to help this process along. And then just briefly about NFLUX, if you're not currently a user of NFLUX, we're a comprehensive data analytics and we call ourselves a decision support system for academic programs. And we're really designed to help you automate the tracking and reporting of your performance metrics, giving you a comprehensive view of your curriculum, but also providing those drill downs into analysis of gaps and student outcomes over time, and then enabling you to identify areas for improvement, to intervene earlier, and take that corrective action a lot faster before we have students who are struggling, curriculum that's really struggling, or a program that seems to be failing. And our stats, we're currently in over 70 universities, 90 plus academic programs and supporting over 100,000 students. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Antonio to tell us about how he does all of this at Larkin University. All right, good afternoon, uh, good morning to some, maybe good evening to others um, and, and welcome. Uh, thank you for attending uh, and hearing about Larkin's perspective and how we address and identify uh, at-risk students and support students and using Influx as well as a few other uh, systems, which I'll talk about today to support students because that's what it's really about. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to give you a little bit of background and institutional profiles so that you can really understand the context in which we are serving our students. We're a very young uh, university. Um, we have recently received um, uh, our SACS accreditation um, SAC COC accreditation, as well as our ACPE accreditation. So I've been with Larkin University for four years, going on the 1st of uh, July, and um, it's been a, a ride. We are private not-for-profit, 
And really what stands out, and uh, I want you to keep this in the mind of the context is that we are an accelerated program. So we are delivering a PharmD in three years. And we are also a block curriculum, which means that we deliver these courses every two weeks. So students in a, in a fall semester, they're completing nine courses um, in this, and roughly the same for the spring. And then the summer, they're completing about five courses. Um, we are currently in an assessment and remediation model. And I'll talk about um, how we got to that just briefly. Um, that is new for us. We are in the second year of that model. We were previously um, an assessment reassessment remediation model. Okay. And our average class size is about 53. And we've just recently graduated our fifth cohort in May of this year. All right. So before I, I really dive in, I want to talk about data sources, right, and all the different types of data sources. And I think it would be appropriate to discuss um, just briefly that what I'm going to show you today, there's a lot of data management <laughs> that comes prior to getting all of these systems to work. Um, if any of my faculty members are here, anyone I've worked with previously, you'll hear, hear me say GIGO, G-I-G-O, and that stands for garbage in, garbage out, right? We can only use the information um, in a manner and interpret data if our data are as clean as possible. So when we talk about data management, um, which we could do um, an entire session on alone, we're talking about really our data collection, meaning um, why we collect data, our, our purpose for collecting it, our methodology and how we structure data, um, as well as how uh, we clean data. Um, and one of the things that we really joy, enjoy working with Influx with is because uh, Influx can work as both an input and an output. Um, so as you all know, in higher ed, we have our student information systems, right? Um, we have our learning management systems. We have um, all types of educational and support software. So what we use to actually deliver our curriculum and support students, right? Um, so that includes anything from engagement and uh, active learning. Um, to uh, assessment. Um, and when I say assessment, I'm talking about from uh, an efficacy and effectiveness standpoint. I know sometimes in the academy in this space, we use assessment interchangeably with exams. I'll delineate uh, those two so that um, we're all on the same page. Um, testing, um, such as exam soft, which you all know, may or may not know, but that's what um, one of the main feeds um, for Influx, and we use that data heavily. And then um, our data visualization and interpretation softwares, right? Um, and Influx, we've used heavily for that um, as both, again, as an input and an output, um, not only to be able to pull data outside of Influx to continue to do analyses and, and make decisions for student support, um, as well as process documentation, um, but also for the visualization and decision making within, within Influx alone. And then um, we also use in 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 house um, Microsoft Power BI for some additional visualizations. Okay, so Influx has a number of suites, um, but today we're going to be focusing on their um, their EDU suite, right? Um, and the different visualizations and data that they have in here. Um, before. Uh, just as a note, anything that you see today that's outlined in this nice purple box, um, those are dashboards that are coming directly from Influx. If it's outlined in a dotted box, that's things that, that we're doing in-house with Power BI. I just wanted to give you that distinction. And so how are we using these different dashboards? Right, so we're using uh, item effectiveness, and what you see next to it is the actual tab uh, that, because they have multiple tabs inside of these dashboards, we're using, looking at assessments across time, student performance uh, and course metrics, uh, a couple of advising dashboards, uh, curriculum dashboard, dashboards, and as well as one of the main features that um, I'm sure um, Megan will talk to you about, which are the uh, action plans, which we find very helpful for process documentation. Um, you heard me talk a little bit about the why um, when you're collecting your data and kind of having a strategy for utilizing your data. And what you're seeing here is our why for each of these dashboards and how we utilize them. Again, the assessment and the item effectiveness we use to monitor exam performance, 
point by serials, uh, difficulty indices, KR20 scores, student performance and course metrics, identifying student and learning outcomes needing improvement, uh, the same for the student academic advising. And a lot of dashboards, um, you know, they're powerful because, um, as you know, with the data, it's all about how you slice it to continue to find um, different meanings from your data, right? Um, and then um, the curriculum effectiveness uh, gap analysis dashboard really helps us identify courses and specific learning outcomes as well as sub outcomes that need improvement. And then you've heard me talk a little bit about the action plans, which I will demonstrate um, and show you how we use those as well. Um, at the end, I'm going to make sure that I circle back to then show you how we also utilize influx for decision making. Um, and that's when it really gets fun, right? When we're able to take that action, that data and make it actionable. All right. So I want to also, um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that even in this process, there was a lot of groundwork, not just from organizing our data and managing our data, but also from a standpoint of doing some level of curriculum analysis um, to understand what variables you have and which variables are impactful to student success, right? Um, I think if, you know, we were in a position, I think it's no secret where we were with our accreditation, but we knew that our challenge was our NAPLEX first time pass rate, right? So we had to do some uh, dig in and jump into SPSS a little bit and try to look at the relationships between curriculum variables as it related to pass rates and specific course performance and PACOA and all of these other variables, um, retention, GPA. We looked at admission criteria to ensure that our cohorts were on the same playing field, right? Were they uh, different so that we would anticipate any, any differences? And, and what we found was that, you know, we had to define what student success was or we had to define our area of challenge, right? And for us, that, that was our first time pass rate, okay? And so with that, we began to be able to develop some types of benchmark to look at our curriculum and what was impacting, okay? Um, and so one of the first things, and now I'm gonna switch over with using influx as, in, excuse me, influx as an input. Um, in the parentheses, you'll also see where we're pulling data from, from other data systems to get to some of these data points, right? So for example, we knew that with our student performance, we needed to be monitoring this is by cohort, um, and what you're looking at is just over time, you're looking at our average scores um, for the entire cohort, which means I can also slice this data by, um, by cohort, by course, um, by uh, topic, um, and you know, by year as, as well, right? And look at trends. And so we wanted to look at how our students were performing. We wanted to look at how our assessments were performing, right? If we we're delivering quality exams, okay? And uh, we take the data out of influx. So one of the things we're taking out of influx, you can see specifically, uh, we're looking at our uh, exam performance metric. Okay, this particular screen is again, demonstrating um, our assessment scores and our items that we're reaching. Um, but if we continue to, to look and move forward. We are also, again, taking data out of influx and looking at our exam metrics, okay? So we're trying to understand uh, our curriculum rigor. So this is just, you know, for one of the examples that we're using, right? And so we're, what we were doing in this process is really trying to dig to understand our curriculum and where some of the pain points were. Again, this is demonstrating by cohort. But again, from our dashboard, we're also able to look at whether it's impacting P1s or P2s, or if it's in our didactic curriculum, or if it's a block course or a longitudinal course, right? And we can look specifically by course. Um, we can begin to understand whether it's not by the first attempt in their assessment or um, the reassess, well, at that point, reassessment, and now specifically re remediation, right? In that study that we did that I talked about, what we found was that the, there was, for the students who did not pass the NAPLEX on the first attempt, that they were reassessing um, at twice the rate of students who were passing, right? 
So that's one of the things that prompted a major curricular change for us where we moved away from the reassessment model because we felt like we were training students that the second attempt um, was okay. It was okay to, to fail on the first attempt, which um, is okay in learning in some instances, um, but not necessarily for um, the NAPLEX uh, pass rate, right? And I do know that, um, you know, it just so happened that the last time that in the academy that we received individual scores was 2020, and that's what this uh, data point was and what it was based upon. And so again, for us, at risk meant trying to define students who finding those those variables for students who were at risk of not passing Netflix the first time. So in that study, what we found was that there were certain courses, uh, in addition to students who were um, not passing the course the first time and at twice the rate, we also had to find those courses that were pain points for those students. Okay, and what we consider was we found that there were certain courses that we deemed as high risk, and those courses had a, a significant relationship with the NAPLEX pass rate and the first time pass rate, okay? Um, the critical courses that we found were, they were not necessarily related to the pass rate, but they were related to progressing through the curriculum, um, and they were over those thresholds. Um, for ACPE, meaning 10% for remediation and 30% for reassessment. How do we do this? Well, that same, um, so some of the same data that we're able to pull in from exam solve, we were able to look and identify which of those courses. This particular, this is actually cut out from the dashboard and it's actually sorted by remediation rates, right? Um, but we can see, okay, if this course had a history of having a high remediation rate and a high assessment rate, or we saw um, in the trend data that I showed you in the previous scale for that particular course, if we saw the means of the, the scores decreasing year over year, but we noticed that the rigor of the course had necessarily changed, right, then, then maybe there's something to that and we needed to look into that. But what we found was there were particular courses that, hey, if we can intervene in these courses, then maybe um, we can be impactful with our first time pass rate. And we had to do it sooner than later. Again, the, uh, the context here is really important going all the way back to our profile. Because we are, we deliver a class every two weeks. What we found was that when a student was not passing a course, it was already too late, right? They, they've they already not developed their foundation for that course, which would be, which could be a critical topic or information in them and their pass rate, right? So we had, to, what we realized is our course was the actual, uh, the course being failed was an actual flag for the variable, right? So the courses became flagged, but at the same time, we did not want the students to fail the courses. So, we had to come up with a strategy to figure that. So how did we identify these students, right? How do we identify these students that are gonna potentially not pass this course and help them out before they fail the course? So the first thing we asked was, were there differences in these courses? And if so, is that difference significant, right? Um, and again, if I go, I'll, I'll just step back really briefly. You can see I'll use six, uh, PH612 as an example, which is at the very top, right? So what we were able to do, we would say, okay, for the students who passed and failed 612, was there any difference in any of the key indicators within that course? And what you can see is the students who passed on the very first formative exam. So the very first formative exam, so they have two formatives and a, and a summative that makes up their grade for the course. And we said, well, hey, this is the average score for students who passed is a 84.6, but for the students who did not pass on the summative, it was a 70.8. Well, hey, we also noticed that there's a significant difference on their very first exam, or excuse me, their very first quiz, their formative quiz. Students who passed made it 82.7, students who failed made it 66.7. Is this significant and is there a true relationship? So what we did was we, um, again, exported data out of um, this time Canvas, right? So I talked about leveraging these multiple data sources and we ran correlations and we saw that there was a statistically significant 
in um, at least moderate correlation between formative exam, formative one, and summative exam. So we got the idea that, hey, we can intervene, right? Especially in these high risk and critical courses, right? That we have found to be impactful to students passing the NAPLEX, okay? And so what we did was we said, hey, well, what's the threshold? We need to develop thresholds. How do we identify these students? And we went through and we tailored thresholds for our high risk courses. OK, so you can see uh, in the alert type, that's the type of course that we have. And then in the F1 threshold, we said, OK, if they are at or below this particular score, then we need to alert and we need to do uh, come up with an intervention. And this is essentially how we developed an early alert plan. Excuse me, and how we also were able to develop a remediation plan based upon the early alert is for if the student does not do well on the first formative, we monitor them, we work with our um, student affairs and academic affairs, um, and we work with faculty members and our student tutors, and we get them to tutoring before they take the summative exam, right? So we look at, you know, what they were, what they struggled with, and we can get those students to tutoring before the summative exam. If they still do not pass the course, then they enter into a remediation plan. Um, and then we also have, before remediation, we have a, basically like a supplemental instruction or review for those students who have remediated in attending um, a remediation, okay? And so now that we've identified, okay, these are our courses, these are our benchmarks, and we said, okay, these are the students, right? Um, and we have an early alert and remediation plan. The question became was, what other factors do we use to continue to monitor the student progress? Because it's not just about that course, right? It's about that holistic education across the entire didactic curriculum. And again, you know, our, our didactic curriculum is delivered in two years. So we don't have the opportunity to really, you know, wait to to find out, right? Uh, waiting for cohort level analyses after graduation. Um, it just, you know, at that point, we would already have put two more cohorts into the uh, into our curriculum before being able to make any other changes. So we said, hey, so what are some of the things, how can we identify students? You know, what can we do to find out um, what are the points they're having issues with? So what we began to do, we began to track the number of total early alerts that they had, the total number of remediations, which for us became essentially that second attempt, right? So we went away from the reassessment model. And so now they're, instead of their re reassessment being a second attempt, the remediation is second attempt. So we said, hey, let's look at the remediation. We also wanted to look at students. Um, again, you know, our, our passing grade for a course is a 75%. So if the student is going below an 80, that may not cause them to fail the course, but it may be an indication that they have not fully grasped the material, right? So students are performing below 80 on the summative exam or the final exam. We're looking at that. We're counting that. We're looking at if the student needed bonus points to pass the course. Um, we, deliver, um, we deliver surveys after every course. Um, to evaluate students, but we said, hey, if they're needing to, to receive bonus points, um, if they're needing these bonus points to pass, then, hey, maybe that's a flag. And then we looked at all of these as a whole as risk factors. And what we came up with was, okay, these two variables that stood out the most was, what's the remediation rate and a risk ratio? So our remediation rate is essentially their number of course attempts divided up, you know, um, against the, the number of the times that the student has actually remediated, okay? And we said, okay, we can't solely go on the remediation rate because um, it's, again, it's based upon the attempts. We, we needed to consider other factors. So our risk ratio, again, is the total number of risks divided by um, the number of courses um, that they've attempted, right? And you can see those two um, towards the, the right, right, a bit. And so what we do now is we say, okay, if a student has a, a high remediation rate and a high risk ratio and we develop thresholds, 
okay, how do we continue to help that student, right? And what we've implemented this year, and again, this is always, as you all in assessment know, assessment is a living, breathing science and art, and you're kind of constantly looking to get better. So we said, okay, we figured out how to identify the courses. We figured out how to identify students as they're struggling in courses. Well, how do we help the students who are still struggling by the time they are halfway through the curriculum or at the, at the end of the curriculum? How do we help those students? OK, and then this is where we move back to um, influx for documentation as well as um, to help students. So from a documentation standpoint, you can see here, this is a screenshot from influx of action plan. We have moved over to using our entire advising system in influx. OK, and so if students are you can what you're seeing here is students who were early alerted for a particular course. Right. And they're they're identified by academic affairs. And then again, we work with student affairs and we say, hey, these are students who were alerted. And that's how we document and track them. And their advisors can see this process. Their advisors are aware. Their advisors are also aware of whether or not they engaged in tutoring um, for this early alert system. OK. Um, and each student has a, a plan. Um, likewise, we did the same thing for remediation plans. OK, so you can see that we're using uh, influx again. Now we went from using it as an input to, to make informed decisions, but we're also using it for documentation and tracking. Um, from there. We said, OK, how can you know, so this is our tracking piece. How can we continue to help students? Right. So, for example, the student who was at the the very top of that list, right? That had the high risk ratio and the high remediation. This is actually that student profile, right? Um, and what we said is at the end of these, this process, if we would reach out to this student and we would say, hey, we noticed that throughout the curriculum, there have been some bumps and there have been some challenges. How do we help you? What we're able to do is use the student performance and, and course metrics dashboard Right under student under the student review tab in influx, and we can actually look at the student's performance across the entire curriculum. And then, as we have our different outcomes, we can also look at okay, this is where the student, you know, they may have struggled with blooms or different PLOs, but the the wonderful part is that you're able to also drill into these for the sake of time. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't I didn't go into too much of that, but as you can see, you have different filters and as you go through different levels, you will be able to go into the sub outcomes. So you can see if it's biomedical sciences, they really struggled with. If it's clinical sciences, if it's SAS for PLOs, you can see which of your PLOs they struggle with, what level of blooms, SLOs, so on and so forth. So this dashboard is a really powerful tool. And what we've done is now for our P2s going into the P3 year, so for our P3s, they're going into their rotations. We're saying, hey, this is the content that you need to focus on in your P3 year to make sure that you're proficient by the time it's time to uh, sit for your, for your boards. And we also offer um, supplemental instructions throughout the P3 year for a particular topic that we've noted. And I'll get to that in a little bit more detail. Another dashboard you can use for this process, again, it's about splicing and changing the lens is same student, different dashboard, right? Now I can see, right? Specifically, right now we're just looking at a portion of ACPE. Okay, I saw that again, if I go backwards, I can see that this student in ACP was a 76 overall, right? For correct over a lifetime of the curriculum on exams. OK, but now I can specifically see, uh, OK, it's human physiology that they, you know, had an issue with, um, you know, or it's, you know, it's patient safety that they had an issue with or self-care pharmacotherapy. Right. So now you're able to pinpoint and advise those students and get them up to par or you can have them engage in tutoring, supplemental instruction. Or we also utilize um, what was formerly known as Rx Prep or whatever other softwares you use to continue your learning support to be able to help students 
figure out where they are and um, give them a, an added boost if there are gaps that that individual student has from the curriculum. Okay. Antonio, real quick, um, yes. I didn't know, I actually didn't know the answer to this question that came in. Was every one of your exam questions tagged to Blooms? Is that a required tag for your program? It is, it is tagged to Blooms. Uh, so for my also assessment folks, um, this is just kind of a, a quality control piece. You can also see all of the asterisks, how many items weren't tagged. <laughs> um, so, you know, yes. So the, you know, whatever you require as tags, you know, again, I'll go back to G Joe, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If we're not tagging well, if we're over tagging, um, you know, we have in the four years I've been here, we have finally got to a place where we are on a, a fairly clean tagging system. Um, I think um, uh, I didn't work with Megan originally into Influx, but when we first pulled our data in, um, it was a lot of data management. I'll say <laughs> it was a lot of data management, um, but it, it also helps you do that as well. And that's another completely different lens. And we could literally, like I said, we could do an entire session on data management, but um, it was a process, you know, so if you're missing a lot of tags or things aren't clean, again, it's gonna be, you're not gonna be as confident to make decisions, right? When working with students or your curriculum. And that's, that's the importance of that data management piece. I hope that answers that question. Um, all right, so kind of changing the lens a little bit, right? So that's the student piece and identifying students, but you know we can do the same thing for for our outcomes, where we can identify our outcomes uh, as well as different courses. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, finding our curriculum gaps and stress points. So for this is where now we're using influx for decision making, right? And identifying issues. So here I'm looking at my tags at the second level, right? And I'm saying, this is my entire curriculum. And what I begin to do was I look at, excuse me, um, trends, right? So I can say, okay, for example, I'll just pull out clinical sciences. I can, well, so obviously I can see everything that's below 80% um, because I've set that as a threshold. That's what I want to know. I don't want to wait until students are at 75 or, 70% until they're struggling again. Um, my background you heard is mental health counseling and we say the best intervention is prevention. <laughs> so, um, and the best way to get out of trouble is to stay out of trouble. Um, and so that's, you know, our, our assessment philosophy and our mindset that we approach is that we wanna say, okay, we don't wanna get them when the thresholds are low, we wanna get a medium level threshold. So you can easily see 80%, but we're also looking at trends. And I would say, okay, why? has clinical sciences declined over you know, the last three years? Again, I go back to looking at, this would push me. My question is why? Did we increase our rigor, right? Did we, um, you know, are the cohorts different? You know, is this cohort, is their profile coming in academically? Not, maybe not as strong. I mean, once you're able to eliminate those questions, you're able to use this data more confidently to find uh, pain points or stressors in your curriculum. And so you can do this by learning outcomes, okay? For the next example, so I'm using uh, personal and professional development, so PLL4, right? And I think um, most folks you're using maybe some type of CAPE, EPA, or and we're, we're all working to move over to COPA. Um, but so I'll use uh, PLL4 for an example. You can also do this for your sub outcome, right? This is the same principle that we did for the student where we drilled down. Right. So here I can see, OK, they're doing OK on clinical scientists, but for clinical scientists specifically, well, I didn't use clinical scientists. I'm sorry. So for our PLO specifically for PLO four, right, I can see where the pain points are. It's more so the leadership portion, right, that they've not done as well in. And in the last year, more so the professionalism portion. So now I know that all of my courses where professionalism is and it's tagged, right? Then we can put an emphasis from a teaching and, and from a teaching and learning standpoint to say, hey, this is where we can beef up our curriculum to make sure that our students aren't uh, deficient on this particular outcome. And this really is gestalt therapy, right? Like all the sum is greater than the parts, but if you can rise all of the pieces of the parts, the sum will be even greater, if that makes sense. Right. And so we, you can do it from a sub outcome standpoint. Um, 
Okay. You can also do it from a a course standpoint, right? So 615, we know, is one of our critical courses, right? Excuse me, 615 is actually a high-risk course for us, right? Because it was tied to Annapolis. But we can see specifically what information um, historically are the students struggling with in that particular course. And again, you can do the same thing and drill down to, oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. You can also drill down uh, again to look at specifically which subcategory over a three year trend or a one year trend or, you know, whatever piece you want to do, you know, you or whatever outcome you want to look at. You can really drill down into that to make sure that um, you're not having any of those gaps. Um, our curriculum committee uses this. We actually use uh, this view to use um, to do curriculum analysis once a year and say, hey, this is where we're identifying this. These are the courses where these topics are. And we say, hey, faculty, you know, maybe the students perform well in this topic in your course, but let's figure out again how we can make all those pieces better so that then in the next year, we can improve this particular outcome for all students. Okay. All right, and at this point in time, um, I know we have a Q&A coming up, but we have a demo first, and I'll turn it over back over to, to Megan. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, that was spectacular. Um, you know, my takeaway is always ask why. Sounds like you use a lot of these things as jumping off points for just further discussion and analysis um, and not coming to it with a predetermined answer, right? You're not coming to it a priori. You're coming to it with that inquisitive nature, which is awesome. Um, the tailored benchmarks, that was, that blew my mind the first time you talked about that, An Antonio, and I actually have a question real quick about the threshold you set for risk ratio um, that suggested intervention was necessary. Was that also tailored as a benchmark dependent on the course? So, no, the risk ratio, because it is entire curriculum and we're, we're basically looking at the number of risks over the entire curriculum, right? So, Here's the here's the truth. We just did this this year, right? And so mm -hmm. we're learning as we go. Um, so I will say our tailored benchmarks have changed for next year for the courses because we did nice. see improvement in some areas. For the risk ratio and the remediation, well, we understand remediation rate, right? If you have a high remediation, if you're remediating a high percentage of your courses, that's a red flag. The risk ratio, we're trying to get a grasp on. And again, we're learning as we go. Um, as you all know, you know, I try not to put too much stock in one, two, sometimes even three data points. Even you could see the charts that I, I demonstrated, right? I try to use at least four data points to get an idea because Again, in a curriculum a context for us at Larkin, right? The curriculum moves so fast, and we, and mm -hmm. as you're making curricular changes, just like any the science piece, right? You're resetting that benchmark anytime you adjust one of those variables in that formula, right? right? And mm -hmm. so, no, we're, we're not not necessarily with the risk ratio yet, um, but we we hope to see. We have identified students, and what we did was, you know, in both instances, we took a more aggressive approach. So we'd rather have a higher false negative than a false positive, right? I'd rather flag you as a student at risk and send you to tutoring, right? Um, and then you pass as opposed to maybe the converse, right? right. Where you, um, we miss you because we didn't flag you, right? And then you failed that course and now you missed out. So we've taken a more liberal approach to, to that, to both of those. Yeah. And, and that was my last takeaway too, is that it's like, it's such a nimble system that you have built so, so that you can be responsive and reactive. And it really does seem like it's addressing all the points of, of intervention, the curricular intervention, the student intervention. I like that you, you know, in your process, you didn't leave off drilling down into those individual students to see where you could support them, but also considering we've got cohorts coming in. And if there's change that needs to be made, we need to do it before we enact a curriculum that we know is not working on students that are incoming. So that Absolutely. full comprehensive start to finish view is just is is super awesome. Um, and for me, it's been it's been great to hear about it. Um, so as you're putting questions in, I'm going to go ahead and show some of our dashboards where you can do some of this. Actually, I'm going to address a question we had right off the top, which was about tagging. So as you said, garbage in, garbage out. Tagging is probably the biggest area that we all struggle with in terms of making sure that our bedrooms are clean, as I call it, right? Our house is cleaned up, that the garbage is put in where it should be and hopefully not in your house. 
So in our demo data, our required categories for items ingests all of your tagging information from your um, courses and exam soft. And it looks uh, on the first in the summary view at just your top level. Did they even tag to that level one, to that category tree at all? So in this demo data, you can see um, it's very tailored for pharmacy since they were our first set of clients really, and still um, one of our largest representations in healthcare. So ACPE Appendix 1 is there, Bloom's Taxonomy is there for everybody. If you're a PA school, you would see your ARC PA standards here, if those are one of your required um, med schools, same with um, NBOME and some of your other areas as well. So those are all dependent on what you have there. And what we show you is percentages, very simply, do you have tags on questions at this level. If it's in orange, it's not tagged, and you can click to identify all of your untagged questions in that category. And if it's tagged, it's in green. If you're a faculty member and you're like, hey, I didn't tag my question, I need to go back in. When you click on an item, we give you a link that takes you directly to ExamSoft where you can add your tag. So you don't have to necessarily have them both open and toggle back and forth. Another view I love here, and this is all filterable by your term, your course, even your assessment type. You can pull out assessments. So if you're just looking at tagging on perhaps remediation exams or final exams, you can see what is happening in those types and include and exclude those as well. But if you're expecting a deeper dive into the tags, like Antonio showed us going down to the third level, some schools go further than that. We provide up to, I believe, 10 levels. Um, in the tagging that we can view in the ingestion. So this is where you would come into the detail view and you would see now, did they tag all the way down into the level that you expected? And one of the reasons I love this view is because it's really hard in ExamSoft to see your joins, if you will, like all the different tags that are on one item, you usually see them rather separate. Um, and here you can see everything that's on one question and that'll give you very quick information. Did they hit all the tags we were expecting and did they go to the appropriate levels? Um, also here, again, if you're like, I need to go in and tag, you can use that uh, as well. All of this is exportable too. And I point that out because um, you can filter down to the item creator. So if you have somebody who is an adjunct or isn't using NFLUX for whatever reason, you can export this data and provide them with a spreadsheet of their questions that need to be tagged. So this is a very quick place to come and see your tagging fidelity. And then since we ingest every Saturday, as people make changes, you'll be able to come back in to your um, initial dashboard here, your summary view, and hopefully see how those pie charts change over time as you reach better tagging. Um, I've helped schools do this like as a tagging campaign where we're downloading files for them, where we're helping them shore up from previous years where they haven't tagged. Um, I think every one of us has probably done some form of that in our career of going back and re-tagging. So this makes that much more seamless and able to identify faster where you might have those gaps. So going with that, looking at the end result, if you will, of what happens when your tagging is faithful here in required categories for items, that's going to help you immensely in this curriculum effectiveness and gap analysis dashboard that Antonio showed us information from that he uses. And that's because it is a, um, it's a unique dashboard in the sense that most of our dashboards run from a general or summary and executive overview. And as you move across the tabs, they drill further down into the information. But in curriculum effectiveness and gap analysis, we're actually kind of looking at like a stepwise analysis, if you will, if it will load for me. I apologize, internet is always an issue. When you're working from home, right? The mercy of Comcast. If that's loading, I'll check our other. So uh, another question um, for Larkin, I think I heard an 80% threshold for curricular review and a 75 for passing score. And that, is that yeah. correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, and we set all of our curriculum and actually we use the same data for course review as well. Um, so we're looking at the, the same topics that we would look at curricularly. We look at for each course um, when we do a three year analysis of our, in our course review processes as well. And then for your model, is your remediation happening after course failure or prior to course failure? 
So the, the early alert, the intervention happens during the course prior to course failure. For remediation, it is happening after. Um, we have a, a unique, I think, remediation model because we have so many courses, like I said, up to nine courses in a semester. We do a midpoint remediation. So um, in the middle of the semester, so after the first four blocks, and then after the five, the next five blocks, we do another remediation session as well. So, right. you know, so the students, you know, if there were any courses that they remediated in that uh, first half of the semester or sec second half of the semester, they would engage in it then. Um, there is a limit. They cannot remediate, um, you know, more than four courses in an entire semester. Uh, okay. For full semester, summer is a little different. All right, awesome. Um, I'm gonna switch up actually out of this dashboard. I don't know why it's not cooperating with me today, which is why I stopped my share. But I do have a question on the best way to show um, performance data. And I can show you some of this performance data um, across an academic year in a different way. And I love that, that we can you know pull in different dashboards. And I'll go back to the other one. It might just need, it might be temperamental and need a moment. You never know with computers, right? Um, so in our students and outcomes, I say this is probably one of the a good area to pull from an for an academic year um, or across time. So in this view, you're actually able to look at the student or at groups, um, which can be cohorts, depending on how your student groups are loaded, to compare performance across time. So you can do this with one student and look at in a particular semester or academic year. So this is everything that the student has done in, um, in ExamSoft all of the terms that they've been in, all of the courses that they have taken. And here we're seeing the number of times that they have seen an item that is tagged to extemporaneous assembling, for example, and then their performance on that. And that can be drilled down as many levels as is necessary. So this is like your aggregate view of the student's performance. If you wanted to see how the student had um, progress throughout your curriculum or throughout an academic year or semester, the student across time will pull that same student over that you had on the first tab and now split out their results by the academic year. You can then drill further down to see how the student performed in the individual semesters that made up that academic year as well. And then the same thing is possible with student groups. So entering cohorts or other groups that you want to follow, it could be high at risk, it could be at risk courses, however you wanted to find those groups. Now we can see one student group across time. We can see how they performed in 2015, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, and then um, drill down into the individual semesters there as well. And then in the group comparison, if you maybe want to look at how did this cohort do in their first year versus how this cohort did in their first year, courses that are tied to the first year, you're now able to come in and look at the cohorts and see, depending on how you filter the information on the side here, what the performance is and the number of times they've seen items. So I'm looking example here for this level two tag, for the cohort of 2024, they saw um, items three times here, but then in 20, the cohort of 2026 saw it 100 times. So you're very quickly able to see what changed. Is it just the performance that changed or maybe it's exposure to those items as well that has changed over time? Both of which are important, right? As you said, Antonio, it's not necessarily just about the performance. It might also be about how many opportunities you're giving them to show performance and to show academic progress over that time. One item is a lot harder for a student to really demonstrate robust knowledge versus maybe 3,000 of them, right? So that difference um, is, is meaningful to students. And let me go back here and see if I can get this. Now I'm moving on me again. Unexpected error tableau. Oh my goodness. I apologize for that. Okay, so I'm interested in pulling data per course versus a class of students. Is there an easy way to pull it instead of changing the course on the left drop down menu? Currently, that's the best way to do it since everything is exportable. You can export your view exactly as, as you have it set in the dashboard. Um, so that is the best way currently to do um, any exporting that way. Um, certainly, we're always happy to help um, if there's like a crunch time or accreditation visit. So we can always chat on the side if you have a particular need. Any other questions that I'm seeing now? Big limitation with ExamSoft being able to show multiple tags that make sense to the tester. Very true. 
using NFLEX to build a better strength and weakness report. Ooh, I love that. Um, Robert, that's a question that comes up often, like how can we share action plans with students? How can we share better reporting with students? Um, and something that is uh, a feature request that we are discussing is the ability to send a preview link or a, uh, a view link to students of an action plan that you have set for them. And so that brings me right to creating action plans with our last couple minutes here. Um, I'm going to show you how you can use these very quickly for that. And then um, any last minute questions or anything we have from Antonio. So when you're in a view and you've, you see something that you'd like to capture and share with others or document for later, you can do that by creating an action plan up here from the upper right hand corner. When you do that, it's going to ask you, hey, are you sure that your visualization is set the way that you want it? This is what we're grabbing and adding on. Yes, no. And then it comes down into this action plan, which is a multitasker beyond belief, right? It can be used to track all sorts of different items, including any connections to your strategic plan or any initiatives related to your strategic plan. If you have a remediation um, template, you can put that in and then copy from that again and again and again to make things easier as you are filling these out, particularly if you have a, co uh, a large uh, class size, it might get really difficult to do so many of them. The only thing we require here is a dashboard insight. What did you see that made you want to capture this in some way? The student is struggling, um, lower than 75% performance, whatever it might be. Once you have a data-driven decision, you can capture it here as well. What are we going to do to help that student? What's our objective and our goal? And where are we in our progress? Then you can classify it or tag it to courses, committees, your standards, which we preload in depending on your, pro your program type. Um, and then any other labels that you have here, we actually allow you to add three additional labels to include KPIs, um, keywords that you want to track, or any other initiatives that you think are important to put a label on your action plans. You can make them actionable or give them a due date, which gives the assignee and the collaborators some information about when they need to fulfill uh, the task that you've given them or talk to the student about the insight. And then here you can actually tag the student. The number one question we get is, does that inform the student? No, right now it's just simply like a, a tag on an item. Um, but what it does allow you to do is track in our action plans dashboards by the student name and then run reports. So if you have students who are at risk, you could run a report to see how many action plans, remediation plans, course plans they've had in a given time period. And then that will include all of the information in the action plan along with the screenshot that we grabbed here. So if I put just test information here and I select a student and I assign it to Dr. Carpenter and myself, I should be able to save it and grab the screenshot. Once you have an action plan set up, you can use these to chunk out the, that uh, action plan a little bit more. So let's say it's a remediation plan for a student that's going to take a lot of uh, time for them to complete or there are different tasks for them to complete. You can then come back into your action plan and enter milestones with due dates. And these would be tasks that need to be marked off at a specific time, really good for longitudinal or long ranging projects or action plans. You can also keep all of your commentary in here so you can communicate back and forth with people, getting rid of the need for emails that you need to log and track. The attachments, you can add additional attachments, but you notice it gives you that initial snapshot so you could pull that out if you needed to. And then everything is captured in the history. So if an action plan changes for some reason, you can come in and see who changed it, time and date, and what they did inside of that action plan. So any last questions after I've shown you action plans or any last questions for Antonio? That would be, uh, we'll give you some time here. And then I will also share with you all um, some contact information if you have questions after you have left this session because I know that I tend to have, uh, remember my question immediately after I leave any given session, right? A uh, good question here, Antonio, is uh, are action plans created for or with students? I mean, from my perspective, either is possible that you can sit down with the student, show them the data, create the action plan together, or create the action plan and send it 
the student to the student. So for the new advising process that we've created, that's looking at the entire didactic, didactic performance with the risk ratio, right, and the remediation ratios. Yes. Um, excuse me. The advisors will sit down with the student and say, "Hey, these. This is how you perform. This is this is why you were." notify, right? Because we know that your X, Y, Z performance across the curriculum and a, here are A, B, and C areas that you can focus on over, you know, this, uh, your your third year, basically throughout your, your appy year. So absolutely, it's sat down with them and they can see and they can understand. I think it's also powerful too, because it creates a culture where the students understand that, um, right, that they're not just kind of going through this process and that we're not, you know, delivering all these exams or whatever assignments for whatever reason. And I think that, you know, when when it comes to them speaking to cohorts that are behind them, that's powerful as well, too. So, yes, it is done in conjunction with the student, meaning the the advising session and the note. Um, as Megan said, the the action plan doesn't notify them, but they are noted. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other last minute questions before we give you three minutes of your day back? Antonio, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, super awesome presentation. I'm getting lots of uh, you know, Q&A and comments on what a great session, great information that you've shared. Um, and I look forward to our continued relationship with each other because it's pretty awesome. Absolutely, thank you, my pleasure. And i uh, be happy to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Um, if you uh, didn't see it in the chat, I left some information there about getting in touch with us. But if you have questions about utilizing the system or how to do any more with our dashboards, my email is super easy, Megan at NFLUX, and I'd be happy to talk with any of you. So thanks again. Have a wonderful day.